Future Hacker. Life. Path. Future. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the international edition of Future Hacker. This is your host, Maria Taigi, and today we are talking to Monika Rogozinska. Monika is a C-level science executive and entrepreneur, a Harvard Business School alumna. She's a strategic advisor at Sustainable Innovations at Vertec Group, board member at Peer Health Exchange, and a mentor at Healthcare Business Women Association. She worked in strategic positions at Adayo Pharma, Merck Group, Pfizer, and Convidian. Hi, Monica. It's so great to have you with us today. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you so much, Maria. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Monica, um, here at Future Hacker, we've been talking about exponential technologies, innovation, and the speed of change. But when it comes to the pharma industry, the process of discovering new drugs or vaccines is so long, right? If you add the discovery phase, the non-clinical, pre-clinical, and the clinical development, it can take at least 10 years to have something available in the market. And you guys, that's what, what you'll listen, like it's like at least 10 years. But it seems that the world can't wait that long anymore when it comes to pandemics, like COVID-19, putting everything at a halt. So how do you think this industry will adapt the urgent needs of a globalized world in which diseases are hardly kept isolated in a single area as they were before? Um, so your question is really twofold. Uh, part of is related to complexity of drug research and development process. And the second part focuses more on the current COVID-19 pandemic and how the life science sector, particularly biopharmaceutical sector, is handling it. So let's talk about those two problems. So first, yes, drug R&D process is lengthy and expensive. It has been estimated basically that the average cost of traditional drug development is around $2.6 billion dollars, and traditional workflow can take over 12 years. Drug discovery is a long, complex process, and it includes, you know, it can be divided really to four major stages. The drug discovery process starts with the idea of target, which is a biological entity, usually a protein or gene that interacts with and whose activity is modulated by a particular compound. That target idea can come from academia, clinical research, or commercial sector. Once that target has been chosen, the next step is to really identify the molecules which possess sustainable characteristics and suitable characteristics to make acceptable drugs. The next step is the heat identification, when do you really, where compounds are identified from molecule libraries. And then there are studies uh, which are kind of going into iterative cycles uh, of structure activity and silico studies that in combination with solar function tests are used to improve functional properties of those new, newly synthesized drug candidates. And subsequently, you go into pharmacovid- pharmacokinetic studies and toxicity studies, which are performed on animals models and then on clinical trials. So yes, this is a very long process. And are there ways to shorten that development cycle? Certainly, there are attempts to do so with use of technology, especially uh, artificial intelligence, and through various collaboration with the life science ecosystem. A second part of your question, indeed, some problems like this pandemic are just too complex and the humanitarian needs is too great to address them alone. The COVID-19 pandemic is the public health challenge of our times. What the industry have been doing, they are really pulling all that knowledge and specialist, specialist skills to concrete effort to discover new solutions together. The entire pharmaceutical R&D ecosystem responded in a spirit of partnership. And you see involvement from pharmaceutical companies and biotech firms, academic researchers, NGOs, and others. All that effort goes into diagnosing, diagnosing, treatment, and preventing infections from that virus. Collaborations between life science ecosystem are not really new, and they are fundamental principles of biotechnology and pharmaceuticals. But 
mainly those collaboration were usually between smaller and uh, larger players. So smaller startup organizations are really feeding the innovation into the bigger companies. And now what we have seen is really something very different because there are more deals between larger competitive companies. One of those examples is, for example, collaboration between Roche Holding and Gilead Science that teamed up on trials for a drug combination to treat COVID-19 and GlaxoSmithKline, which is also another very big pharma with a Sanofi to produce 1 billion doses of the coronavirus vaccine booster. And driven by that humanitarian need, we are witnessing some very creative novel partnerships we would never expect before the COVID. So take, for example, Novo Nordisk, uh, which is a typical pharmaceutical company, which works with giant drink producer Carlsberg, which work together to convert ethanol into hand sanitizer for Danish healthcare system. On the top of that, all those large companies are sharing proprietary libraries and they work with philanthropic organizations such as Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to accelerate the drug development. There are existing partnerships like Innovative Medicine Initiative, which provide a platform on which, um, on which the new initiatives can be launched very quickly. And another one, example from Europe, uh, which brings the power of European supercomputers to speed up the identification of active compounds to be tested in humans for novel treatments for COVID-19, which is called Exascalate uh, for COVID. That's one of the partnerships. And there are all the, about all those partnerships. There are other partnerships which are more typical, but are still very important in times of pandemic like this and times of crisis, which are between big companies and smaller companies, like between Eli Lilly and Vancouver-based Absolera on the COVID-19 antibody and treatment, another treatment of coronavirus, which is coming between uh, from the AstraZeneca teaming up with Oxford Biomedica, which is another uh, another smaller organization. And also in the meantime, researchers are evolving the process of publishing research results in journals and opting to share the data uh, with the entire world in real time, which is unprecedented. There are only few examples, those which are mentioned, how life science sector is actually coming together at the challenging times like COVID-19 pandemic. That being said, it's really not an easy process from a legal standpoint. Same pharmaceutical and biotech companies have to navigate a host of legal issues, and those issues relate to the patents, trade secrets, competition, and um, they need to really negotiate who owns each slice of intellectual property and who will have the right to use any inventions. So traditionally, deals can take a really long time because the innovators' companies can be really reluctant to share their technologies. But here, due to the pandemic, there's increased willingness to do this, and that willingness didn't exist before. So as I look into the future, I hope the lessons learned in terms of the power of working together on collective genius in this crisis will reframe future collaboration to benefit uh, not only our profession, but ultimately the patients we serve. It's really great to see the companies coming together and we can definitely see that the speed of uh, the industry response in this case has really been out of the ordinary. And we all do hope that we can get finally access to a vaccine pretty soon, right? Uh, but, you know, uh, moving on. As you just mentioned, uh, the pharma industry is already making use of new technologies like artificial intelligence and machine learning to improve many processes uh, like predictions, as well as to make some discoveries more accurate, such as imaging, processing, and ana analysis. So could you just give us some examples of trends of those new technologies and what are the currently the main boundaries? So um, at present, uh, many pharmaceutical companies face challenges in their drug development program because of increased cost of reduced uh, efficiency. A lot of our research effectively goes down the drain because it includes money spent on the nine out of 10 candidate therapies that fail somewhere between phase one trials and regulatory approval. 
To alleviate the problem, the industry applies many impressive new uh, artificial intelligence methods and tools to make those R&D processes more cost and time efficient. AI actually has enormous potential to revolutionize the drug discovery. An example I can I can really provide is the utilization of AI and machine learning in a drug screening. So for example, a traditional high throughput screening library, which is usually includes like 1 million compounds, where each compound typically costs around 50 to 100 U- US dollars, you know, initial process can cost several millions of dollars plus several months of work. Subsequent optimization of a lead compound may take several years to identify the preclinical drug candidates. So by contrast, if you add AI on it in that equation, a virtual compound library of several billion molecules can be screened within a few days. It may take basically a few months to one year to identify preclinical candidates by using the artificial intelligence-based computational pipeline, which is huge, huge uh, improvement. Traditional experiments Structural biology that usually takes several years to resolve, for example, protein structures, also can be really shortened, even take a few hours to a few days for prediction of 3D uh, structures of target proteins. AI has also been used to cell image, image processing, physical bioactivity and toxicity prediction, AI is also used in planning chemical synthesis and operating robotic system for organic synthesis to further improve the efficiency of drug discovery. So in general, all those processes, which sounds very scientific, but they are really tedious to perform. And with the help of AI, can be automated and optimized and you know, substantially speed up the drug discovery process. And your second part of your question was really related to technology limitations. Currently, those computational men- me- methods that I, you know, that include AI, do not perform well in all the drug research areas. For instance, accurately predicting the binding affinity between the drug molecule and target protein remain very challenging. So, what the binding affinity is? It's really a strength of the binding interactions between single biomolecule, for example, protein, to the binding partner, for example, drug on inhibitor. Using of AI has the limitation due to very specific reasons. AI is a data mining method, and the performance of AI models depends on the amount of quality of the available data. And successful training of deep neural networks relies on large amounts of training data. Maybe in the future, when the development of transfer learning technology, the system will learn from one task uh, and be able to apply to other tasks, but this is really not the current state. The quality of the available data is something insufficient for efficient AI learning because experimental data and public databases are often not measured with the same methods or conditions. So you have sometimes completely different methods that yield completely different data. Public data and public databases contain multiple contradicting data sets. Thus, before per- performing specific AI tasks, filtering the raw inputs and really denoising the database is an essential step. It's that important 3D target structure information um, they are lost when transferring 3D atomic space to 2D interpretation of AI calculation. So to conclude, obviously there's a tremendous amount of work that has been done to incorporate AI tools to expedite the drug discovery cycle, but resolving the problems of current AI limitation discovery will be really necessary to realize the full potential of AI. Also, there is a huge promise in ongoing and future partnerships in AI space. The pharmaceutical companies invest both in internal AI-based R&D programs, as well as in cooperation with AI startups and academic institutions. I really foresee the number of those collaborations will increase with time. Yes, and talking about that, so you, you just mentioned how important this is, the, the, the amount of quality data and the collaboration, right? So following that line of thought, 
as we all know now, for AI to work best, it needs to work with as much qualified data as possible. And in the ideal world, having this unified data bank in which the pharma industry could collaborate would speed up the processes and decrease R&D costs. On the other hand, we have all the data rights issues and, you know, the confidential information are sensitive subjects, especially in this industry, right? So companies may not share competitive data for various reasons. How to solve those problems to help humanity cure diseases and improve the quality of life of many? Yeah, that's a great question. Legal aspects of collaboration can take a lot of time to negotiate as the companies may be hesitant to share their technology, as I mentioned before. But, you know, the good thing is that the willingness may increase with the right motivation as we have seen it during the pandemic. Uh, I really believe COVID-19 may definitely change the way how the partnerships are formed, leading to more strategic open collaborations, especially be between the major players. Many new partnerships use what is known as a single application technologies, which are inventions with one pharmaceutical ingredient or one mechanism of one particular disease that the new invention applies to. Those are really easier from the legal standpoint because the innovative startup companies are more eager to share it and uh, give the control to big pharma or big med tech company. Things get really more complicated when the drug makers are partnering on so-called platform technologies. So those are basically inventions that can be applied across a whole array of applications. So for example, if you have a novel ingredient that can be added to vaccine to boost its effectiveness, that could be potentially used later for non-coronavirus vaccine. And when they negotiate, negotiating the collaboration conditions, companies uh, will have to decide who drafts and files the patents, how to structure ownerships of that intellectual property, and who is funding each segment of research and development, trials, etc. During uh, the partners' interaction, it's vital they avoid anti-competitive conduct, which means uh, the deals must benefit the public and the communication between the different parties stays away from several critical issues like pricing. Um, you know, companies cannot really exchange any information on companies like business plans, sales information, research in connections with particular customers or market areas. This is considered a hardcore violation of antitrust laws. One of the ways how the companies can collaborate with each other, despite of the IP antitrust concerns, is application of AI partnerships through federate learning. And for people who don't know what federate learning is, this is also known as a collaborative, collaborative learning. It's a type of machine learning that trains an algorithm across multiple decentralized edge devices and servers holding local data samples and without really exchanging them. An example of such a partnership uh, last June is just recent a partnership between 10 pharmaceutical companies an agreement to build a shared platform called Melody, which stands for Machine Learning Ledger Orchestration for Drug Discovery. And in partnership with NVIDIA, Okin and others, the group sought to leverage techniques like federated learning to collectively train AI on data sets without having to share a proprietary data. Regardless, local algorithms are trained on local data samples and their weights, which are learnable parameters on, uh, on the algorithms, are exchanged between the algorithms at some frequency to generate that global model. So they train their predictive model in the, identif the identified aggregated fashion with without exposing private research data or information. And over the next couple of years, you know that uh, system is going to work hard to improve their performance in learning on more data as it comes. Those are just few examples of very powerful co collaborations between the various companies in federated learning, which are exposing private research or information. A lot of great information, uh, Monica. Thank you so much. This is the end of the first episode, everybody, but stay tuned that we're coming back with Monica on the second episode of Future Hacker International Edition. Stay tuned. Future Hacker. Life. Path. Future.